Another summit to save the planet. From Aquaman to Emmanuel Macron, 7,000 scientists, activists, and leaders meet for the UN's Ocean Conference. But will all the talking make for real change? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the world's ocean emergency. From world leaders and scientists to movie stars and diplomats, there were some pretty heavy hitters attending this year's Ocean Conference in Lisbon. And like many other UN-led climate summits, the warnings were clear and familiar. The planet is in peril, and we need to do something about it now. Our oceans are issuing an SOS. They are struggling, heating, and acidifying. Corals are dying. Coastal ecosystems, such as mangroves, seagrasses, and wetlands, are being degraded. Fisheries are being depleted, and the ocean is choking in plastic waste. We must work together to right these wrongs. Well, more than 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. Without it, humans simply cannot survive. Oceans provide half the oxygen we need, not to mention food for billions around the world. It's even home to many medicinal ingredients that help fight diseases, including cancer. But if we carry on neglecting it at the rate we are, within half a century, the seas could be damaged beyond repair. Researchers fear that by 2040, the amount of plastic in our waters could triple. And by 2050, we'll be fishing more plastic out of the water than fish itself. Sea levels are rising rapidly. NASA says the three millimeter annual rise may not sound like much, but the impact is terrifying. Coastal cities could become flooded, drinking water contaminated, and many farmers would lose their livelihoods. During the conference, Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, said if we change our ways, not only can we help save the planet, we can actually save millions from starving. If we manage the ocean more sustainably, it could produce as much as six times more food, generate 40 times more renewable energy than it currently does, and help lift millions of people across the globe out of poverty and increase economic as well as environmental resilience. But outside the summit, hundreds came out to protest. Frustrated by decades of inaction, they say the time for talking is over but fear the world's decision makers just don't care. The fact that we need to end all industrial fishing, particularly bottom trawling, but we need to end this now. The oceans are empty. We are catching less fish now than we were 30 years ago with all the advances in technology. The, the seas are dying and we need an appropriate urgency that we're not seeing from our leaders. So while protesters cite the inaction of many world leaders, a small few have been recognized for taking dramatic action at home. One of them joins us now. Carlos Alvarado is the former president of Costa Rica, and he's just been recognized by National Geographic for his outstanding commitment and action toward protecting our oceans. His Central American nation is on track to get at least 30% of its land and sea federally protected by 2030, even exceeding some of the expectations set by the United Nations. Carlos Alvarado, thank you so much for joining us uh, from San Jose. You know, Costa Rica, I gotta say, it's really a unique case globally, almost an anomaly, because for years, decades even, uh, you've managed to make protecting the environment profitable by becoming a pioneer in, in ecotourism. What made Costa Rica realize that conservation could be a win-win for business and for the community? And what were actually the trade-offs to make that model work? Well, I believe the key thing in this is a shift in paradigm. We cannot remain thinking that uh, economic growth and human development is against conservation. Mm -hmm. Conservation and human development are but one part of the same equation. It's the same thing, because if you think about it on the long run, without conservation, without a healthy environment, there is no future for 
for humanity. And also we realized in Costa Rica that conservation actually triggered our clean industry of tourism. Tourism is very important around the world. And in our case, tourism became one of the key drivers of growth across all Costa Rica. And that has a lot to do with uh, conservation, also with democracy and other traits, but conservation is very important in that. And we have managed to realize that. And in that mere fact that we have achieved conservation most recently in the oceans, 30% of our oceans already protected, means that uh, it is possible. If one small nation in the middle of the Americas can do that, larger, more robust, more uh, wealthy countries can do it. You've managed to realize, you know, how it can benefit everybody and how it's not really a choice. Conservation has to take priority, but still you, you're going to have to fight. You had to fight and other nations will have to fight. So where and against whom did you have to fight the hardest to get environmental legislation actually passed? Well, I think the key uh, fight is uh, is in terms of awareness. Is explaining uh, people why is it so important. We do not understand necessarily, for example, in the case of the oceans, why is it so important to protect the oceans? But the oceans provide us with uh, with food, many livelihoods for people around the world. Oceans are responsible of moderating our climate. That is to say that the oceans and the health of the oceans is key to address the climate crisis. And also, oceans provide more than 50% of the oxygen in the planet. So oceans are uh, at the center of the life in, uh, in planet Earth. When you start to realize that, uh, then you start to take action, because there's not going to be uh, a world as we know it. Uh, if we do not take that action. Imagine for a next generation, for example, an ocean without any life whatsoever, no fish, no dolphins, no plankton, uh, no krill in the oceans, but just pollution. Uh, that's, that's a sad picture to, to, to imagine. And we need to change that in order for the children and the next generation can enjoy a healthy ocean as well. Right. I mean, you talk about awareness, but you're also in a country that is host to some of the world's you know, greatest levels of biodiversity. A lot of other countries don't have that. So it's, it's difficult to make people aware. And it's also difficult to convince industry that they need to conserve uh, environments that aren't as ecologically appreciated. Let's put it that way. So can your model actually be scaled? do you think, to, to other countries who don't host the same kind of diversity that Costa Rica does? Yes, I'm sure about it. The, one of the great examples is the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and, and People. In 2019, uh, during the One Summit, uh, the One Planet Summit, Costa Rica with France and the UK launched the High Ambition Coalition to protect 30% uh, of the ocean and 30% of the land by 2030. And by that time, it was just five countries who, who we were part of that coalition. And by that time, many people were very skeptical. And they said, it's impossible to protect 30% of the world's ocean and the world land. But just uh, last Monday, during the ocean conference, it was announced that the High Ambition Coalition has already 800 countries so in three years, the coalition passed from five countries to a hundred countries that are oh. committed with this goal. So that is a demonstration that change is possible and we can do this. And also that it is profitable. The most recent research from National Geographic says that through conservation, you can increase the number and the size of fish that you can uh, that you can exploit economically, if you have protected areas, the fish will move across not only protected areas, but areas mm. in which you can fish, and that can be also more profitable. And also, for example, this uh, research says that we sea bottom trawling, that kind of fishery, is not only destroying biodiversity, but it's releasing uh, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. That means the problem is double, not only right. destroying biodiversity, 
but making climate change uh, worse. So again, I mean, it, it, it's all logical. And the numbers have been there for a long time. Politicians have been aware. Um, so if you do think it is scalable, what has stopped other countries, um, especially those with similar biodiversity and, and coastlines to Costa Rica, what, what's really stopped them from doing the same? They do know the benefits. This has been sold long ago. Like I said, Costa Rica has for decades uh, been making a profitable profitable model out of investing in ecotourism. What's stopping the rest? Well, I do believe now we are in a tipping point. Uh, let's not, I, I, my approach is not necessarily that they are being stopping, but we're waiting for them to catch up. And I think that's going to be possible. And there's lots of things going on recently. For example, uh, the aid from uh, developed countries to other nations in order for pro to, to have protection. Also, the philanthropy across the globe is working together to mobilize finance uh, for uh, countries to protect their oceans. And science is playing its role in finding ways in which we can both work economically with the oceans, but with a mitigation of the impact. So several things are, are going on at the same time that are making easier to take these decisions, which are the right decisions for the future of humanity. Okay, Carlos Alvarado, it's, it's so good to hear your optimism. Uh, let's hope you're, you're right. Thank you so much, really, for taking the time to be with us on The Newsmakers. Greatly appreciated. Well, let's get a closer look now at what global action is being taken to protect the world's oceans. And joining me from Kiel, Germany, is Abed Arrahman Hassoun. He is an oceanographer and scientific researcher at GEOMAR. It's an ocean research center in Germany. Laura Meller joins us from the conference in Lisbon. She is an ocean policy advisor for Greenpeace. And in Sambalpur, India, is Ranjan Panda. He's a convener for the Combat Climate Change Network. Thanks all so much for being with us. Laura, I'll start with you. As we said, you are at the conference. You've commented before on what a disappointment our leaders have really been when it comes to taking action on protecting the oceans. But have you been left with any elevated sense of hope in Lisbon, especially after the UN Secretary General apologized for his generation's failure to protect the oceans and then declared an ocean emergency? Um, yes, uh, good afternoon. I think this week we have certainly heard many uh, declarations uh, and voluntary commitments and good pledges uh, to protect the oceans, while we also know that if declarations would save the oceans, they would not be on the brink of collapse as they are today. And so um, what I think will ultimately define the success of this conference is whether governments will um, agree a strong global ocean treaty when they meet in August at the United Nations in New York. What are you thinking, though, now? Are our leaders finally convinced that they can't keep delaying action? You know, they try to say it's in the interest of their economies and that, you know, that they have to protect their people first. We've seen more and more countries actually turn inward, really looking to domestic policy rather than taking global action for the global interest. Do you think they're finally changing? Well, I think... Um Measuring by the words, there we have. Um, there has been a great surge uh, in political momentum and commitments to protecting the oceans. Um, at the same time, looking at what the reality is at sea, uh, we see uh, plastic pollution. We heard just this week that uh, fish populations continue to be depleted by overfishing, um, and the people who rely on healthy oceans for their lives and livelihoods are um, in deeper and deeper trouble. So right. I think the negotiations at the United Nations, they really represent uh, a key opportunity to reset the way uh, we look after our oceans and put protection and equity before profit. You know, I'd like to, all three of you really, uh, each of you has your own very personal experience with the effect of climate change on the oceans. And I want to talk a little bit more from that personal angle. Uh, but I'll start with you. I mean, you usually work, if I'm not mistaken, out of Lebanon. 
tell us what you've actually been seeing in the water there. As we remember, this actually used to be pristine Mediterranean coastline. How has it evolved? Actually, because of climate change, we, are, uh, we were able to see lots of climate change trends and consequences in the Mediterranean, but also in Lebanon, which is located in the eastern Mediterranean side. So unfortunately, we were able to record uh, warming and uh, ocean acidification trends. So what we've you've been uh, we've been actually seeing uh, in the videos and pictures that you've been uh, uh, playing uh, while while um, the colleagues were were uh, talking. These are the visible consequences of a human contributions. However, there are so much invisible. Uh, changes that are happening in the ocean, like the warming, the ocean acidification, etc. And all these consequences have been already uh, recorded in our Lebanese water, in the Mediterranean, but also in the oceans, in different parts of the ocean in general. Yeah, I mean, w when you look at a country like Lebanon, that should have this pristine Mediterranean coastline. I mean, to see that basically half the coastal beaches have been closed because of toxicity in the water. I mean, does that wake people up, not just in Lebanon, but around the world, to the fact that it's, it's their quality of life now that is so deeply affected by pollution of our collective waters? People are, are more and more aware now with the ocean literacy and the awareness campaigns that are happening in Lebanon and otherwise um, elsewhere, actually, like in, in other Mediterranean countries and uh, other countries uh, globally, people are getting more um, involved uh, in uh, protection and management practices and initiatives. However, this is not enough because we know that we need something bigger than that in order to reduce the pollution and the climate change consequences. Mm. We need uh, something more governmental and also intergovernmental. So people alone can do um, can do so much nice things, but it's not uh, enough, unfortunately. Yeah. So in order to 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 uh, to protect marine ecosystems against. Uh, pollution and against ocean acidification, warming, etc. We need uh, different governments to collaborate together and we need decisive actions and not only declarations right. as uh, Laura, Laura has mentioned. Yeah. You know, Ranjan, you are in India, uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Yeah. I, I once heard someone say um, that there the sea shouldn't actually qualify as water because of the bacterial and chemical pollution. What are you up against? You're trying, protect, trying, trying to protect, protect water along your coastline in the Bay of Bengal specifically. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the show. I think uh, uh, the sea or ocean systems, uh, definitely they're, uh, they're the, uh, I would say, one of the largest global commons. But then uh, they're, they're far away from our policy you know, perceptions from the imagery that our policymakers build, uh, that's because many of the communities who don't stay near the seas, near the oceans, uh, actually don't really understand, uh, despite of uh, the growing you know, awareness uh, you know, around it throughout the world, they, they really don't understand the interface, the relationship that, uh, that the hinterlands, uh, you know, that the freshwater ecosystems, they have with the marine ecosystems. And that's the reason, you know, all that we uh, pollute uh, the rivers, uh, the, the, fresh light, the fresh water ecosystems, all the pollution load that we give from the municipalities, from the cities, they actually end up, most of that actually end up being in the sea. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we see the color of the sea. We are very fascinated about it. Uh, everybody feels that, you know, that's a refreshing place. But then, uh, but then monitoring of pollution of the sea, we already are lacking in monitoring of pollution of the rivers, but then monitoring of the ocean systems, uh, you know, for pollution is absolutely lacking. So that's the reason, you know, you don't understand many, many of the policymakers, in, including policymakers and people, right. they really don't understand that that you know what we we dump in the rivers is actually going to the sea and all the pollution load that comes from the cities like for example 10 
uh, out of the 10 uh, uh, rivers that actually carry all the plastic loads to the uh, oceans, almost eight are in, in, in the Asian region. So uh, this is huge. Yeah. But then, uh, but then there is uh, there is absolute no no interconnectedness, mm. and then, you know, interconnectedness between uh, people working on marine ecosystems and pe people work working on freshwater ecosystems. Right. I think that is where a lot lot of challenge lies. You know, speaking of uh, the plastics, uh, Laura, I'll come back to you. We've heard environmentalists, of course, complain <laughs> about the oceans becoming actually a giant stew, not just of plastics but microplastics as well. How bad is it yeah. really? And Laura, is it comparable to kind of the airborne pollutants that we are breathing more and more every day? Or is it worse when it's actually concentrated in water? So it's even harder for marine life to continue to survive in polluted marine environments. The marine pollution is definitely a huge problem uh, for marine life. And I think, um, in broader terms, like it's the it's one of the most kind of visible um, signals to us that we really need to learn to live within the planetary boundaries, and we can't keep treating our oceans like they they would be uh, indefinite dumps or uh, indefinite sources of uh, whatever natural resources right. we want. Um, yeah, they're being treated as, as kind of, you know, junkyards almost. Um, it's as if, you know, we take our, if we can't have landfills, we can dump straight into the ocean and then it just is, somehow is going to disappear uh, and become not our problem anymore when we're actually increasing the problems for us. So, I mean, what, what needs to be done about that? Because is it more legislation, more punishment for illegal dumping into the oceans? Is it being regulated enough to start taking punitive action? I think from governments to companies and uh, international treaties, uh, we need to mainly stop the problem at its source and find a way to reduce uh, the waste that is uh, ending up in the oceans today. Um, and I think the same goes with, uh, with how, we tr how we look at the oceans and um, like setting, setting limits to um, how, how much fish uh, we can take out or uh, or if we like trying to right. um, respond to the hunger of uh, ever growing hunger of minerals by looking for them in the deep seabed mm. uh, causing permanent damage and destruction um, we really need to kind of understand uh, and set the boundaries and set the limits um, according to what marine life can take right. and uh, let me ask Abed, I mean, it, if you can also testify to some of the problems that plastic pollution and microplastics are causing, and also this, you know, illegal, unregulated, so often unregulated fishing industry, how much is that a problem? How much is that robbing our seas of and actually killing the water that we need to survive? It is absolutely killing uh, the marine ecosystems and uh, the resources for generations. What I want to say, because you've asked a very, very critical question, which is what should be done? I mean, we cannot manage what we don't know. If we don't know exactly what's happening, not only just marine plastic pollution, but also other aspects of um, a human, let's say, pressures happening in the ocean. If we don't know it, then we are not able to manage it. And we are not able also to know what will happen to vulnerable communities like coastal communities, etc. So we need to better invest and to better fund, uh, you know, a huge funds for, for research. Uh, as the colleague from India has mentioned, we need better observations, innovative and transformative ways of observations in order to check how the different uh, properties and uh, processes in the oceans are interacting together and how they are affecting marine life and also uh, marine uh, uh, coastal communities relying on this marine life. So uh, what, what should be done is to invest significantly in marine observations, okay. in research. Yeah. Ranjan, can I, I, I got a 45 seconds left. Can I just give you quick final words? Yeah, I think, I think uh, my colleague said very rightly, something very elite uh, data is something uh, is very elite at the moment. 
what we really need is a lot of information to be generated and as i said a synchronized action between uh, you know freshwater uh, systems and marine systems otherwise we are actually uh, not going to solve the problem okay ranjan panda laura meller and Abed Al-Rahman Hassoun, I'd like to thank all three of you so much for being with us on uh, this edition of the Newsmakers. Greatly appreciate it. Our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Be sure to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel for this and much, much more. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.